Okay, so good afternoon to everybody. It is my pleasure to open this uh, public event organized in the framework of the UIDEA project, an Horizon 2020 project started in 2019, uh, with an event organized by the European Policy Center on the future of the European Union UK relations. So first of all, let me thank on behalf of the UIDEA Consortium, the EPC team for the great work in organizing this uh, uh, debate. We were supposed to gather together in Brussels in this uh, crucial week ahead of the uh, final outcome of the Brexit uh, negotiations. But I'm sure that we will have in any case a very lively debate thanks to the uh, distinguished speakers that will uh, participate in our panel uh, this afternoon. So my task today is to uh, briefly present uh, the UIDEA project and in particular the activities under the Brexit Observatory. And then I will uh, hand it over to uh, Yanniki for the um, coordination of the uh, debate on the uh, topic. So let me first of all share my screen. Hope you can see uh, the slide um, summarizing uh, the main articulation of the UIDEA project. Well, uh, when we started our project back in 2019, uh, we moved from the assumption that uh, um, differentiation could be identified as a concrete way forward for Europe in order to respond to the many challenges that the European Union was facing at that time. First of all, uh, still the um, aftermath of the financial and economic crisis, especially for some EU countries, uh, the migration phenomenon, and also the political tensions that led to uh, fragmentation between uh, member states. We did not predict a pandemic in 2020, of course, but as we can see, uh, the topic of our research is still uh, very relevant in today's uh, European Union's agenda. We're still uh, waiting for a final uh, outcome of the uh, Brexit negotiations. We're still uh, struggling uh, to identify means to overcome the stalemate in the um, approval of the uh, next generation EU package due to the uh, veto of two member states. And we're also trying to uh, make uh, uh, differentiated integration in the field of defense more effective and meaningful. We still think that uh, um, it is advisable and also possible to um, develop a new idea of Europe based on uh, differentiation. But we are, of course, also aware of the many challenges connected to this uh, scenario in terms of effectiveness, in terms of uh, cohesiveness of the European Union, and also in terms of accountability which uh, inevitably arise from uh, um, the complexity of differentiated integration. With this in mind, we have approached, first of all, the uh, subject from an historical and philosophical point of view uh, to understand which are the roots of the integration and differentiation process in Europe. Then we have uh, uh, suggested an innovative theory of differentiation uh, with regard in particular to governance and accountability in the European Union. And also we have analyzed the impact of differentiation on uh, European legal uniformity and political cohesion to understand what can be the impact of differentiation on the um, coherence and unity of the European Union. Now we are applying all these uh, findings to uh, three main uh, um, policy areas, namely the economic and monetary union and the single market. Second, the foreign security and defense policy. And finally, the area of freedom, security and justice, including migration. Uh, we will also assess the citizens and national preferences on integration and uh, all these with a view to develop future scenarios of differentiated integration within the European Union to be proposed to uh, policymakers. This is a very ambitious project. We have 15 um, partners in our consortium, uh, think tanks and universities within, within Europe and outside uh, the European Union. Uh, we have 57 researchers involved. 
we will address 12 case studies. Uh, we will publish 61 um, publications, 14 videos, nine podcasts, and five infographics. So I think if we want to, you know, uh, know more about the project, just go to our website and social media uh, to find out what we will uh, do in the next uh, year ahead. From my side, it is a real pleasure to uh, coordinate this project together with the YAI team. And uh, particularly, I would like to thank Matteo Bonomi, who is my colleague, who is following with me the entire project. So uh, in the project, we have also placed particular attention to uh, Brexit, of course, with a dedicated observatory coordinated by the European Policy Center. And in this framework, we have launched a new idea award called uh, Framing Brexit. Uh, well, I'm particularly glad today to uh, announce the two winners of this uh, contest. You can have a look at our website. Um, the winners of the competition are Madlena Kay, uh, Megan Daniels, and Ola Mendiska. Uh, they all present today at this conference, so I would like to congratulate them for the artwork they have presented. The uh, objective of this uh, uh, contest that we launched was to address um, young people in and beyond the European Union to understand what, what was their vision about Brexit and their feelings about Brexit. And we asked them to produce uh, visual and uh, uh, video artworks, uh, which we received and we assessed together with the other members of the UIDEA Consortium. And thanks also to the cooperation of two experts in the field of visual and uh, uh, video art. Uh, well, if you look at the uh, work that we have selected, first of all, the one from uh, Madalena Kay, um, and the second one, uh, a video by um, Megan Daniels and Ola Mendiska, I think we can find some very interesting approach uh, to Brexit. Uh, in particular, Madalena is focused on Brexit portraits, while Megan and Ola and their team have focused on a video uh, looking at the lack of communication and miscommunication uh, in the case of Brexit. So I think they offer a very vivid and unconventional views of Brexit and encourage all of you to have a look at this uh, work at our uh, website. Um, of course, we will involve the winners of the, of the award also in, the, in our next activities and particularly in the final conference of the project that will be organized and in Brussels at the end of next year. Hopefully, we will see each other in person uh, by then. And so now, without uh, further ado, let me uh, just hand it over to Yanniki Vacovic, um, uh, which will coordinate uh, our debate today on the future of EU-UK relations. Thank you, Yanniki, please. Thank you very much, Nicoletta. Um, also a warm welcome from my side. Uh, my name is Janneke Wachowiak and I'm a policy analyst at the European Policy Center. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by an excellent panel today to discuss the future of the EU-UK relationship. Um, so a very warm welcome to Stefan de Rink, who is head of unit at, at the Commission's Task Force for Relations with the United Kingdom. Um, welcome to Kati Piri, who is an SND member of the European Parliament and rapporteur on Brexit in the Committee on Foreign Affairs. I'm also delighted to be joined by Sir Ivan Rogers, who was the permanent representative of the United Kingdom to the EU from 2013 until 2017. And last but not least by EPC Chief Executive Fabian Sulik. And um, before we start our discussion, just some technicalities. Uh, I will kick us off with a few questions to our panel, but I would also like to bring in our audience and open the floor for questions from you. So there are two ways you can ask a question. Um, you can either uh, click on the handshake button if you want to ask a question in person, or you can write a question in the Q&A box. Um, if you want to send in a written question, I would ask you to please keep your questions as short as possible so that I can see at a glance what it is you're asking. 
So um, turning to the topic of our debate today, where are we in the Brexit negotiations? Um, I think uh, it is safe to say that we are in a rather extraordinary um, and um, situation um, where we have 28 days left until the end of the transition period. And we still don't know whether there will be a deal and indeed whether the UK government wants this deal and whether it is willing and has the political space to compromise. Um, so there are a lot of things to discuss, the remaining sticking points, Johnson's decision, the internal market bill, the finance bill, uh, the issue of time and the time ratification, and of course the long-term relationship. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Stefan de Rink and um, I would ask you to briefly explain to us where we are um, as much as you are able to tell us at this significant moment in time. Um, do you think both sides are still committed to a deal? Are we actually closing in on a deal or is this question of deal or no deal still very much open? And if there is a deal, will there actually be enough time to ratify it before the end of this year? Um, Stefan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yannicka. Thank you to the European Policy Center. And good afternoon to everyone. Well, I'll, I'll get perhaps to the question. If you allow me a few minutes, Yannicka, just to, to kick off, then I'll, I'll be very brief, but I'll, and I'll come to your questions on both sides being committed. Uh, but you introduced it by saying, well, we don't know where we are. We know for a fact that in 28 days, a lot of benefits of EU membership will disappear. So free movement of people, goods and services end on the 1st of January, capital, the automatic right of British students to come study in the EU and find a job perhaps afterwards, even without sufficient means to sustain themselves for a short period of time that ends. So a lot of benefits of EU membership will disappear. And that is one of the certainties that we have. The financial services passport will of course be gone. The audiovisual services who want to broadcast in the EU will, based on the country of origin principle, will need to be established in the EU. There's a whole long list on professional qualifications being more complicated in terms of recognition and no longer automatic for some of them. Uh, free movement of services ends. There'll be cost a bunch of red tape, customs formalities, export health certificates for EU animal derived products that come into the EU, SPS checks at the border. Many member states have done a lot of efforts to prepare infrastructure, human resources are put in place, IT. So a lot of work has gone into preparing for what is inevitably a disruptive moment at, at the end of, of, of this month. And so that is, in all the uncertainty that we have, I think it's important that we don't lose track of no, a number of the fundamental issues that, that will hit us on, on the 1st of January. And it will not be mitigated in any case by a future partnership agreement. The second point of the three points I would like to make by way of introduction is that what we know for sure also on the 1st of January is the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland must be fully implemented and respected. So it kicks in on the 1st of January. HMRC must therefore be ready for the new procedures which we had agreed with uh, Prime Minister Johnson a year ago in terms of goods going from GB to Northern Ireland. The environmental agricultural inspections or the vets uh, inspections must be up and running on the 1st of January. We've done a lot of good work in the Joint Committee. We were doing a lot of good work when the UK internal market bill hit us. And I think, again, it's uh, one of the certainties on our side at least is that this must be fully implemented and rigorously implemented on the 1st of January in the way that it was agreed with Prime Minister Johnson. We had not agreed a possibility for Westminster to unilaterally change what was in good faith jointly agreed in, in the protocol. Uh, we had agreed a democratic scrutiny process and we have agreed, of course, a democratic scrutiny process in Northern Ireland as part of the package that we had agreed back then uh, with Boris Johnson on the application of the protocol. So the Northern Irish political voices and parties will, of course, have their say in due time on the application of the protocol, but in the meantime, it must be effectively and at 100% implemented. So the burning question is, of course, what happens these days in London? I'm sitting in Brussels, by the way, but I'm in touch, of course, with, with Michel Barnier and the, and the negotiating team in London. Um, well, we are at, I would say, the end of um, a marathon run. We're probably beyond 
kilometer 40, but there's still, there's a way to go still. Um, my colleagues ate some pizza last night, as some of you know, so I'm not sure if that's a wise thing to do in kilometer 40, but I, they, they must have needed some energy to see how fast they can run the last two kilometers. I cannot say how fast that process will be. That is unclear today. The, the talks are continuing, and I can also not guarantee that we will reach that finishing line with an agreement. It is certainly my feeling that both sides are committed to finding a deal, but that deal must, of course, on our side, respect issues like the single market integrity and the autonomy of the EU's decision making. And the UK says that it, no, it, it needs its sovereignty respected, and that is, of course, something which the EU does not contest. But the key question is to what purpose does the UK want to use that sovereignty and what legally binding obligations does it want to undertake with the European Union for that future partnership agreement. And the three stumbling blocks are well known, the level playing field, fish and governance. And I'm happy to, to come back to those issues later on because I've probably spoken for too long already by, by way of introduction. But the long and short of it is work continues in London, significant divergences remain. Both sides are working hard to try to bridge those divergences. And as of today, the outcome of that process is uncertain. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan, for this first um, introduction and assessment of where we are. Um, I would like to um, ask Kati Piri next. Um, Stefan has said we are basically beyond kilometer 40 in the marathon. And, um, what is certain is that we are um, slowly but certainly running out of time. Um, so I would like to ask you about the question of timing and of course the ratification. Um, a statement by the UK coordination group and the leaders of the political groups of the European Parliament from the 11th of September reads, um, the European Parliament will not accept having its democratic oversight curbed by a last minute deal beyond the end of October. We are now at the beginning of December. Um, so what does that mean for the European Parliament's democratic oversight? Uh, we know even if a deal uh, is reached, um, there are still a lot of step, steps. The text needs to be legally scrapped, uh, translated into all official EU languages, and then scrutinized and ratified by the European Parliament, possibly even national and some regional parliaments. Is there still enough time for these legal and democratic processes, specifically in the European Parliament? And if not, um, what about the possibility of provisionally applying a deal pending full ratification? Is this something that the European Parliament could get behind? Thank you very much. Also, thank you for this invitation. And I think uh, very uh, rightful questions. And uh, to be honest, uh, I already had the feeling uh, in July that we were perhaps at the end of the marathon, or at least hoping we were at the end of the marathon. And the question is for the last two kilometers, whether we'll be still running or crawling. And uh, that, that still depends on the, on, on the timing. What is clear is that we will not be able to have the normal democratic scrutiny that the parliament normally has with, uh, with trade agreements. Of course, we also know that is the first time, hopefully also the last time, that the EU member state leaves the European Union. So we, are, of course, also understand that these are, uh, you know, very exceptional circumstances. What we have said, uh, and you just read the statement, is that we would have needed by the end of October um, an agreement to before the end of the year to do the normal scrutiny process. And the normal scrutiny process in the parliament would have been that the foreign affairs committee of which I'm the rapporteur and the trade uh, committee of which my colleague uh, Hansen is the rapporteur can first do their assessment and then bring it to the plenary. This would have been the normal procedure. Now, I, I have to say together with all my colleagues in the European Parliament, we have been extremely flexible when it comes to, uh, of course, hoping that we will find an agreement, of course, not going beyond the red lines, which, uh, which I think Stefan also just uh, very well mentioned, the same red lines are the sticking issues, which are still there at the negotiating table. And we will have an extraordinary procedure. And the extraordinary procedure will be uh, that we are willing to work through uh, Christmas to have an extraordinary plenary 
in the UK coordination group, which is set up in the European Parliament, where we have the chairs of the Foreign Affairs and the Trade Committee, and also individuals representing their political parties will be working on a joint resolution. But just to be clear, this is not the normal process, how the European Parliament scrutinizes trade deals. So yes, our patience is also running out, but I don't think we are the only one. I think the same is happening in EU capitals. Now, I think it's also clear that this can only be an agreement which is EU only. There is no possible way uh, which uh, whereby before the end of the year, and I think this is also where the council agrees that it has to be an EU only agreement, that we could still have a full fledged ratification. Now, when it comes to, um, I think in addition to what uh, uh, Stefan de Rijk has said, uh, we in the parliament have also made clear that those provisions of the internal market bill, which are in contradiction uh, to the, actually in breach of the withdrawal agreement, will have to be off the table before we can ratify an agreement. I think uh, this position has been uh, also very clearly communicated on behalf of almost uh, all the uh, group leaders representing 90, 95% of the members of the European Parliament. And then to say on, um, on provisional application on your question, and I'll finish with that. You know, like, like I told you, I think we have been extremely flexible in order to make uh, ratification possible before the end of uh, the year. And uh, it's absolutely, you know, Parliament's flexibility cannot be, uh, will not be rewarded with having its democratic uh, scrutiny oversight uh, being sidelined. So uh, also on this, we had a meeting of the Conference of Presidents last week in the European Parliament and the European Parliament will do its utmost best as soon as there's a deal. And that has to be now within a couple of days. Otherwise, this is no longer possible uh, to, uh, to have an extraordinary plenary and to have the ratification and the scrutiny process before the end of the transition period. So just to make clear, we are against a provisional application. Thank you, Kati Piri, for um, this very clear uh, answer. Um, I would like to turn to Sir Ivan Rogers next, um, and um, I would like to ask you a bit about the mood music in the UK and Boris Johnson's decision. Um, we have heard that we need um, we need a decision, we need an agreement in the next couple of day days, ideally. Um, how do you perceive the mood music in the UK? Um, I mean, it seems like Johnson is under increasing pressure from his party. Um, maybe not so much on Brexit at the moment, but on the implications of lockdown restrictions on the economy and personal freedoms. And um, this is interesting because there seems to be an overlap between those MPs who are lockdown critics and those um, who are um, pro-Brexit or who are the hardline Brexiteers in the, in the Conservative Party. Um, in, in your view or fr from your um, point of view, um, is Johnson, still in control of this anti-lockdown pro-Brexit part of his party? And is he willing to face these MPs um, over a Brexit deal? Or might he consider a no deal to be the politically more expedient option? Well, thanks very much, uh, Yannicka, and thanks to EBC for inviting me. Um, those are excellent questions. And by definition, uh, like the rest of this, pretty unanswerable at the moment. You're right to say uh, he faces um, quite a serious revolt and has faced that this week on uh, lockdown uh, version two and he's under attack as you say very much from the same people who are core members of the European research group and that uh, there's an ever proliferating uh, number of research groups in the Conservative Party which are you know, essentially lobby groups and the Conservative Party really as we've seen probably over the last 20 to 25 years under successive leaders has become you know more ungovernable and more unruly now, some might say, um, I don't wish to be unkind, that Boris Johnson was a considerable part of making the Conservative Party more ungovernable and more unruly for his two predecessors, um, David Cameron and Theresa May, both over this very European question. So there's, there's quite an interesting Robert Shrinsley article in the FT that some of you will have read about, is the, is the revolt, regicide, repeat, sort of cycle getting ever shorter in conservative politics. So that is, I think you're right that that's the moment we're facing. 
And of course, the argument for going for no deal is you don't want to fight on two fronts with the same people who are beginning to wonder whether you are the true revolutionary leader committed to the purest version of Brexit that they want. And that's why on the other side of the Conservative Party, you're seeing people demanding that he now finally breaks with the ultras, you know, the European research group ultras and does a deal and faces them down. I don't think anything is that simple. I, I don't think he will face them down because let's be honest, he's there partly because they put him there and brought down Theresa May. He brought down Theresa May with them, but without their assistance, he couldn't have brought her down. Uh, so the idea that he's going to face down the European research group and turn them into permanent um, enemies of his or potentially permanent enemies over the European question is a fantasy world. He won't do that. But that's not to say that, um, you know, he's decided on no deal. I don't think that's the situation. And um, as Stefan was rightly reporting, I think there is a mood in the negotiations, as I perceive it, that both chief negotiators are now, you know, bending every effort to trying to find ways of bridging the gaps on the three, the three big issues. I suspect, um, you know, I haven't worked for Boris Johnson for four years, but I worked for him a bit as foreign secretary. I suspect um, he hasn't taken a completely final decision yet on what he's going to do. He may not also have a completely accurate assessment, at least in my view, totally accurate assessment of where this thing can land. Or although one would hope that his assessment of where it can land is getting more and more accurate, the more that David Frost tells him about where they are this week. What he would have to, it, I mean, it's rather bizarre that it comes down to this, uh, and let me finish there, but I mean, it comes down, it doesn't come down to the ec economics and above all, not the macroeconomics. So many of you will have seen the Office of Budget Responsibility analysis uh, in the financial statement last week, which shows that no deal is an appreciable further hit beyond a skinny free trade deal. I have to say, I think that makes no difference at all to Boris Johnson's position, any more than the Treasury or Bank of England analysis showing exactly the same thing in 2016. So I think that makes no difference, whatever. And it wasn't mentioned by Chancellor Rishi Sunak in his oral statement last week. Nothing was referred to at all about the ABR report, which is crystal clear on the macroeconomic implications of no deal. This has never been primarily about the economics. It's genuinely about the politics and the sovereignty. It's also about the coalition that this conservative government, which is very different from any previous conservative government I've worked for, is trying to marshal to dominate British politics over the next decade or two. And the curiosity with Boris Johnson is after all, he's a metropolitan establishment, liberal thinker, and that's his background. And he's running an anti-establishment, non-metropolitan, an anti-liberal cosmopolitan values party um, and that's how they're winning um, and that's why they've got Labour in, in trouble. So I mean on the key issues he has to emerge with a win on fisheries and then the question is what does a win look like and to be honest there's not much science on what, what a win looked like but the question for me which I, I don't think I can answer for you is have they built expectations too high in the Conservative Party and amongst fishing communities um, and the MPs, many Conservative MPs who now represent those fishing communities about what they can win and what the nature of the win is. I just don't know. They've, they've talked outlandishly high and optimistic assumptions about what can be delivered in this deal. They're clearly going to fall short of that, but what I can't answer is how far short of that they can fall and still claim a triumph. The other triumph that really matters for him with the European Research Group, and I've just said to you, I don't think he will face down those people. He wants to keep them very fully on board with the, the Johnson project, is sovereignty. And that's why level playing field was always crucial, because non-regression clauses or evolution clauses or precisely what happens in the event that you are perceived by the other side to have breached this deal are critical. And he will have put David Frost under huge pressure, I'm sure, over the last nine to 12 months to say, you've got to be able to guarantee me that in any de deal I do with the European Union, I can say with a straight face to my own party that I haven't compromised one vestige of UK sovereignty. Now, there'll be many in this room who, uh, or in the, on this call who will think, well, that's simply undeliverable because that's not the nature of modern trade deals. And I might be one of them. 
but the way in which it will be presented in the Conservative Party is, don't worry, we haven't committed to anything here that will bind us to do something inimical to British interests or enable the European Union to challenge uh, what we're able to do in some way that enables them to overturn what we intend to do domestically. And that's a very high bar to meet. Uh, so, I mean, we can no doubt come back to that question. Uh, in practice, I've always thought there are ways through that if he wants to find ways through that. But that comes back to the question, which I think will only be answered this weekend or early next week. Does he feel that that is a success that he can say to the Conservative Party leaves us with completely unconstrained, untrammeled UK sovereignty? Or does he feel he can't sell that proposition and that he'll have a very significant rebellion on his hands if he if he tries to, if he thinks the latter, then we'll end up with no deal. Thank you for, for that very interesting input. Um, Fabian, I would like to turn to you next. Um, and I would like to ask you about um, this issue of constantly delaying a decision um, on the UK's part. Um, we also published a short commentary on this question today, and um, I would like to um, hear your thoughts on, on this issue. I mean, Johnson seems to be pushing this decision to the brink. Um, is this because he is unable to decide, or is it in a way also tactical? Um, is it one or the other, or is it both? And how can um, and how should the EU react to this? I mean, the EU has always made clear that it will not walk away from talks, um, but do you think there is a risk that patience on the EU side might run out? Thanks, Janneke. Um, yes, I think um, what we are seeing is continued brinkmanship um, from uh, Boris Johnson in particular. Um, and uh, we can only speculate what is his underlying motivation but um, I would suspect that it is actually a mixture of the different aspects you've mentioned. Um, I think there, it is partially in his character. Uh, it is the way he sees negotiations uh, that is linked to also this belief that in the end, a deal has to be made between Britain and maybe the two big member states, uh, it's Berlin and Paris who in the end will make the deal not the negotiators on the ground. Um, I think uh, there's also a certain amount, um, if not even a dominant amount of domestic considerations here. Uh, we know that um, pushing a deal through will be a lot easier uh, if uh, there's very little time because there will be very little scrutiny. Uh, there will be uh, the threat hanging over uh, all of those voting on a deal that it is either that deal or no deal. And that applies also to both sides uh, of, of the channel. Um, and I think uh, there's a very good chance that in the end, um, as um, Ivan has also said, that he hasn't decided yet, that he doesn't know yet what in the end he wants to do because it will depend on his political judgment. But the overall question here is, um, will he push it so far that it is too late, that we get to a point of no return, uh, and then we are in a no deal territory simply because time has run out. And I think the, the chance is rather high that we're going to get there, also because um, it is linked to the timetable in the UK. And here I'm particularly referring to the UK Internal Market Bill and the Finance Bill. Um, I think once these are on the table and we have all indications at the moment that uh, the intention of the UK government is to reintroduce the UK Internal Market Bill to introduce the Finance Bill next week um, with all of the clauses um, intact. Um, so going back to even reinforcing the uh, decision to break international law, to break the agreement with the European Union. I find it very difficult to see how after that has happened, we can then come to a trade deal um, in, in the following days. Um, not least because um, I think this is also something uh, which is very difficult politically for the European Union. Um, to be put into a position 
where the UK government essentially says we will only reduce the uh, we will only remove these clauses mm. if the European Union gives us a trade deal, knowing full well that if a trade deal then is concluded, um, the UK would also um, put this line of argument as their main um, argument into the public sphere. We have won over the European Union. We have forced them to concede on X, Y, Z. Uh, I think that's politically very difficult, and I'm not sure that all the capitals um, would be willing to accept that line of argument. So the timing dimension, this tendency uh, towards brinkmanship, towards last minute decisions, uh, in combination with uh, the internal market bill and the finance bill, I think um, makes it unfortunately very likely um, that we end up with no deal unless there is a resolution rather quickly in the next few days. Um, and as far as I can see, there's still um, a long way to go. We might be at kilometer 40, um, but the question is, are the last two kilometers a swamp? Um, or are they a, a clean road we can run into? Um, it's a bit like saying, as we have had before, you know, we are 98% there, yes. But if the 2% are governance level playing field, uh, fisheries, uh, then we're not 98%, there. Um, then we are nowhere. Um, and this is, I think, uh, the, the decision which will have to be taken by number 10. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I'm not even sure uh, that he's ready now to take that decision. Thank you, Fabian. Um, Stefan, I would like to ask you to also comment on um, the significance of the internal market bill and the importance of trust in these negotiations um, and also the importance of trust for the future relationship. Um, as we've just heard from Fabian, the current expectation is that number 10 will seek to reinsert the controversial clauses um, in the internal market bill next week. And additionally, the UK finance bill is expected um, to be tabled, which might contain even further breaches. So of course, if there is a deal over the weekend, um, that might give the UK a face-saving way out, a face-saving way of dropping these clauses. Um, because they can say that they are no longer needed. Um, but what happens if negotiations don't come to a conclusion over the weekend and the UK um, follows through with this? What does that mean for the EU's position? And also maybe a few words on how you see the sequencing of this. I think this is all extremely puzzling. I mean, the UK internal market bill was an act of bad faith, as, as the Commission said in its letter of formal notice to the UK to which we have so far not received a reply. And we are, of course, considering what next to do on that particular matter. But the puzzling element to me is what, what is the UK trying to achieve with this? Because this is not a bargaining chip in the future relationship discussions. Uh, Fabian hinted at that, but that, that's not what it is. So that doesn't impress us in terms of the negotiations on the future. Our lines are very clear on, on what we need to obtain in, in fishery as an essential and integral element of the partnership, on non-regression, on state aids as the two key pillars of the level playing field, on, on governance, and all of this does not change that. What it does change, I think, is the international reputation of the UK in terms of having included an agreement one year ago, and while well, your question hints at it, is there still trust? And as the President von der Leyen said, yeah, trust is very good, but the law is, is much better and we need law here. And so we need to, the last stumbling block is to put these three issues that are still standing in between us and a deal into a legally binding text. And then it comes to Ivan's point on modern trade policy and, and, and sovereignty and, and what, what purpose it serves. In modern trade policy, you undertake obligations. It, it may be difficult for Brexit advocates to conclude obligations with the EU, but that's just what it is that's just part of international law and international agreements and so that's what we what we must come to and to come back more to Yannicka to your question directly I mean, obviously the, the, there can be no violation of the withdrawal agreement uh, and so that is basically something that that, that has to go 
And that's the, that's the position of, of, of the EU and also what Cathy said on, on, on the European Parliament is very important, I think, in terms of the consent procedure. Thank you, Stefan. Um, so I think it seems as if, uh, even though we might be 95% or 98% there, um, there's still um, a huge risk for an accidental no deal. And I would like to um, come back to Kachi and um, ask her what a no deal would mean for the European Union, um, because we know that the impact of a no deal within the EU would not be even. Um, so some countries will be hit harder than others. For example, Ireland, the Netherlands, Belgium will be among the more affected countries. So given this asymmetric effect of Brexit and maybe also the asymmetric um, ability of countries to respond to this economic shock, um, do you think that there is a risk for um, EU disunity after Brexit? Or for example, might some um, member states be tempted to do bilateral deals? Um, or can we expect coordination and solidarity between member states um, post the no deal Brexit? Yes, I think if we would read back articles uh, from four years ago, the expectation was very much that the EU would be so divided, right, in these negotiations. And we are now in, in the final phase of either a deal or a no deal. And what you have actually seen is an extremely united European Union all the way in these negotiations. And to be honest, London also made it much more easier to stay very united as a European Union. I have to, I have to say that as well. You were saying, of course, it will have asymmetric effects, but first of all, asymmetric when you look at, on the one hand, the UK, and on the other hand, the European Union. Although Boris Johnson said that a new, no deal would also be a good outcome, I think uh, it's clear that the numbers disagree. Uh, this might be politically, ideologically a good outcome, but in terms of the uh, economic effects on top of all uh, that our countries are facing right now, of course, with the pandemic, I think is a catastrophic, uh, catastrophic issue. And it's clear that the country losing most from a no deal in terms of at least economy will be the United Kingdom. And then of course, it's true that we have this asymmetry within the European Union, the country I, I represent, the Netherlands is uh, one of the countries uh, uh, together with Ireland and Belgium, which are among the top three of most heavy hit, and then of course specifically certain uh, certain sectors. I think in case of a no deal, this means especially for road transportation and air traffic, we'll need to find uh, agreements there. But of course, we also, and this is why you know the patience is also running out because everyone seems to be so focused on the deal, but we still have a lot of also contingency measures to legislate upon before the end of the year also in the European Parliament in case of a no deal. And uh, this is also what you see among the, the, the member states. You, uh, there have been media reports also from the meetings uh, that took place at the ambassador's level in Brussels that you know, patience is running out there too, that we have to start now the contingency measure uh, legislation also from the commission with 28 days to go before the end of the transition period. Just to give you one example, in the Netherlands, at least these were the estimates made just before the Corona crisis. There might have been, of course, uh, um, uh, more recent estimates uh, on this, but with a possible deal, the Netherlands would still lose 17,000 jobs, one seven, 17,000 jobs. In case of a no deal, this is probably going to be 70,000, so 70,000 jobs. So, you know, for the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, uh, after, after uh, Germany is the biggest trading partner. So there needs to be, as you know, the, the Council has reserved 5 billion euros for in this so-called Brexit Adjustment Fund. Uh, there needs to be, of course, uh, especially for those sectors and those countries which are most heavily hit. But let's be honest, of course, those 5 billion will not be able to cover all the damages uh, done with a no deal. So to be absolutely clear, I don't think anyone in the EU is wishing for a no deal. And on the other hand, let's also not forget 
that a deal that goes beyond our red lines, especially on level playing field, on regression, uh, when it comes to social and labor and environmental standards, would be, of course, also much more catastrophic, not just in economic terms, but also in protecting the consumers, protecting uh, the single market of the EU. So also that does not come without a cost. So this is also where the inflexibility, inflexibility of course, is of the European Union when it comes to the level playing field. Thank you. Um, I think Stefan would like to um, give a direct response to that. Not so much a response, but I think it, Kathy makes a very interesting point about the difference between no deal and deal in the Netherlands in terms of job pr predictions and forecasts. Sometimes you hear the argument that well, it doesn't really matter so much the difference between this kind of deal or, or no deal, but that's absolutely not true. So if you look at it from the UK's perspective, there's a huge difference between striking this, the deal that is on offer. There's a huge difference for the car industry, for pharma, for farming, for transport in different modes, for energy interconnectivity and all those kind of issues. So what is on the table is a, the flip side of what Cathy says that for the UK, what's on the table is a very valuable deal. I think we should not forget that. People speak about a skinny FTA. This is a, an agreement that goes way beyond what an FTA usually offers and it, it encompasses all the sectors that, that people know who are on this call. So it is, it, it is global and comprehensive and therefore it is economically valuable. Also for the EU, of course, that, 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 that's Cathy's point, but also even more so for the UK. Thank you for that um, addition. Um, I see that we already have quite a few questions from our audience um, and as we wanted to um, be as interactive as possible with this event as well, um, I think I would already take a few of the questions so we can answer as many as possible. Um, and um, I see that we have a virtual hand from Shona Murray. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself um, and ask your question. Shona, are you able to unmute yourself? Seems to be difficult. We could, we might come back to you um, later. Uh, we also have a question from um, James Crisp. Um, are you able to unmute yourself? I hope so. Can you can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. I'm sorry if you can't see me, I'm being useless on this sort of thing at the moment, I'm afraid. Um, just a, a quick question to both uh, uh, Stefan and Ivan, please. Uh, what role do you see uh, for the heads of state and government of EU27 in the coming days if we do edge closer to uh, a deal? I mean, it would seem to make sense that there would be some phone calls to make sure that the trade deal gets a warm uh, reception at the summit if it can be done in time rather than uh, risk it being rejected. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we will um, take uh, another question maybe before going back to the panel. Um, Shauna Murray, maybe we try again. <laughs> if not, um, then we also have a question from Malcolm Harbour. Malcolm, if you would. Yes. Uh, um, I'm, yes, I think I'm unmuted now. Can yeah. you hear me right? Yes. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to see Ivan and Stefan, who I know um, from previous encounters. Um, the, really, the question I wanted to put is that, I mean, I think I just wanted to correct something that you said, uh, Jenica, earlier about the fact that um, uh, 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 people who are, um, shall we say, anti-lockdown procedures are all Eurosceptics. I mean, that is actually not the case if you look at voting in the House of Commons last week. There are plenty of pro-Europeans um, who actually voted against Boris Johnson's um, measures. And I think um, the point I just wanted to get a comment on is I think that the, um, the current situation at the moment uh, you know, with quite a big rebellion against what's going on. In other words, because there's quite a lot of turmoil at the moment in the Conservative Party about that. Um, uh, seems to me that um, it, it, it's going to, I think, 
considerably increased the pressure to have a deal. Uh, I mean, most of us have felt that it was absolutely inconceivable. Uh, and I've devoted it with Fabian on many occasions on this. He, he remain, he, I think he feels that I'm being entirely and unduly optimistic. Uh, but I just think that the, um, the problems associated with that, I think, are something that the government really doesn't want to have on its plate, along with all the other issues that it's, it's coming up with, despite the news about vaccines, which one has to be careful not to be too euphoric about. Uh, so that, that's just my first point. Um, I think my second point is that I don't perceive, and I am still a member of the Conservative Party, even though I was um, a very pro, you know, very anti-Brexit, uh, is that there's been relatively little noise, actually, from the members of this European Research Group. And in fact, they're, one of their principal leaders is now principally leading the, um, uh, some of the lockdown restrictions. So there's been a diversion of interest there. I mean, my sense is that, um, that, that they, are act, they are in the mood to accept a deal. And, and I'm not sure that Boris really feels he needs to play to that gallery now. Uh, I think he just needs to be convinced that there's an elegant way out. Uh, and the fact that we're starting to talk seriously about fish uh, and the fact that the papers in the UK, and this is a point for Stefan, I think, are, are perceiving that the EU is moving uh, that I think is working in Boris's favour, <laughs> you know, to show that his tough negotiating style is paying off. Um, I mean, I take a very cynical view of that, rather like I, so I, Ivan, but I think so. Anyway, that that uh, given that I know probably less about it than most of you do, but that's just my my take as as an informed observer sitting in a very grey afternoon in England. Thank you, Malcolm um for your optimism as well um also <laughs> good to hear an optimist optimistic view from time to time um so um i think those comments or questions were mostly directed at um iron rogers and at stefan um maybe iron rogers would like to come in first um very oh. briefly and then i would also like to bring in kati period though because she has to leave us at four o'clock, so um, just to give her some time for some final thoughts, maybe before she has to leave. Uh, well, uh, thanks again. I mean, good to hear you, Malcolm. I mean, you, you may be right. I've heard both arguments uh, uh, applied, uh, you know, from 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 different Tories in London of my acquaintance, uh, either that there is now greater pressure for a deal for the reasons you describe, or that he's under sufficiently great pressure from rebellions in the party that he doesn't want to open up a second front uh, with uh, you know, ERG people. You're right, they've been reasonably quiet, uh, but my experience, and I imagine his experience with these things is, you know, they tend not to be quiet when they see a text and the text, when they see it, I mean, obviously none of us have seen it, but it's, um, there's a lot to get through and it will be examined by all the usual players and the usual suspects, including the, uh, the favorite ERG lawyers who will get to grips with it. And I would be amazed if there weren't plenty in it that they really dislike, uh, because you can see where the deal must have come out um, in order to get to what is a skinny free trade deal. I agree with Stefan, there's not nothing in it, there's quite substantial things in it. Um, but nevertheless, there's going to be a lot in here that the classic kind of ERG lawyers who dominated the scene through Theresa May's government won't like. Now, they have a different prime minister. We have Brexited. We're in a different phase of the game. They may be able to persuade themselves that, you know, there is an awful lot they can still do in 2021, 2022 to force greater divergence from the European Union. And that's the real battle. But nevertheless, when they read the text, and it's a voluminous text, there's going to be a hell of a lot in it that they really won't like the look of. Uh, so I think that's one, one thing um, I would say. And, you know, when the rats get at the text, you know, when they see a text, and they presumably have to see it at the same time as European member states see it, it'll start to leak out, you know, it may be more difficult to govern. So the question is, how much has this government managed to roll the pitch effectively on fisheries and sovereignty? so that the potential troublemakers in the party um, are aligned with, you know, when Johnson declares victory, he has to declare victory. And just to come back to the internal markets bill and finance bill point, of course, um, in terms of deliberate flagrant breach of international law, you know, I can well imagine the kind of Brussels and European capitals reaction. 
it's fascinating that they took no account of what that reaction was inevitably going to be when they took the decision to do the internal market bill. And they're doing exactly the same on the finance bill that will be introduced next week. That points, of course, to the reality that if you don't do the deal within the next few days, it's going to be exceptionally difficult to do, although there may be ways of you know, uh, putting back the introduction of the finance bill, which contains further breaches of international law uh, beyond the middle of next week. But it is timetabled for the middle of next week and the reintroduction of the internal market bill is timetabled for Monday. So the, uh, it's, it's, it's tight. I mean, all I would say on this, on the economic question is uh, really what I've said before, which is, yes, we all know that no deal um, is appreciably worse than um, a skinny deal, really appreciably worse, and for multiple sectors of the UK economy, much worse, and not just the UK economy, as Katie and others have said. The trouble is, it doesn't necessarily come down to that. And think of it from a purely political perspective, which I'm afraid is what will be going on in Downing Street. You're going to have a lot of chaos on the ground anyway in January and February 2021. That's pretty unavoidable. There will be those arguing in Downing Street. OK, a couple of them may have disappeared in the last couple of weeks, but there will be those arguing in Downing Street. Well, we're going to take 70 to 75 percent of the pain and the chaos anyway. And for a deal that you would be describing as a glorious negotiating triumph over the European superstate. And six weeks later, it'll be obvious on the ground that there's really quite a lot of mayhem and quite a lot of chaos and quite a lot of disorder and confusion. Whereas if you go 100 percent of the way for a worse a worse economic outcome, or so the experts are telling us, nevertheless, you know, if you get 100% of the pain, you can blame it all on the European Union's intransigence, inflexibility, and desire to beat us up and turn us into a colony and a client state. And, you know, everything I've seen over the last many, many years, including working for all these people, is that that kind of policy, political judgment of kind of what is it going to be easier to sell and how is this going to look and how is it going to sound you know, will be dominating a lot, of, uh, a lot of discussions. As I say, please don't get me wrong, it's not saying that I, I think it's inevitable that he will go for no deal. I think that David Frost wouldn't be making a serious effort in the room now unless he had instructions to make a serious effort in the room. But if you look at it from their perspective, there is going to be a lot of turmoil on the ground in the midst of the COVID crisis in, in the first quarter of 2021, even in the event of a deal. And you would have trumpeted that deal as a glorious negotiating triumph. And then the public will be within its rights in eight weeks time to say, well, it doesn't look like much of a triumph to us. So you've got to think of this very politically because they'll be thinking of it very politically. And they'll be thinking of how does it play if we try and sell this deal and, and then it looks a bit, a bit crap on the ground in eight weeks time. And how would we play it the other way if we go no deal deliberately? Thank you, Ivan. Um, I would just like to quickly give the floor to Kati Puri and um, ask her if she has any comments on what we've heard from our audience, um, but also maybe to, to sum up from your side, are you still an optimist? Um, what do you think are the chances of a deal at this point? Um, just maybe um, yeah, conclude in a few sentences before you have to uh, leave our panel. Yeah, sorry for that, for having to leave earlier. Well, um, uh, just to react to the, to the previous speaker, I think even politically, it's very difficult to understand. Uh, and that is perhaps because uh, I think, um, I see at least voters as very rational people. And I think it will be extremely difficult sell, but perhaps I'm too Dutch uh, for this and not, and not in inside uh, UK uh, uh, politics, but in Holland, it would be impossible to sell that politically. But OK, uh, let's see. And of course, we're still waiting uh, for the white smoke. Let me just say uh, um, uh, say this. Um, I, st I was very happy when I was 18 to be able to study one year in the fantastic uh, city of Cambridge, not at the university, but at the International Language School. And uh, I have always had much respect for, for Britain. And um, of course, we would, I personally would have liked to see uh, this Brexit not happening, but we accept that this is the choice that was made by a majority of the British citizens. And while we are in this very painful phase, I also hope in the coming years ahead, where we will see perhaps also, you know, different attitude beyond this um, uh, very painful, um, Brexit uh, divisions that we also find ways of cooperating. 
and cooperation on much more than just trade. And this will be my final remark. I've been working in the European Parliament now for seven years on foreign policy, on defense policy. And this is an item which is not now uh, discussed at the negotiation table, where, where I think we can have so much cooperation in the, in the years ahead, be it on coordination of sanctions, standing up for uh, a rules-based uh, world order, and perhaps also having President-elect uh, Biden in the White House uh, will help to also in these fields uh, further nourish our, uh, our relationship. So I'll leave it with that and thank you all very much. Thank you very much um, for your contribution and um, for participating in our panel today. Um, so we will of course continue the discussion um, with the remaining panelists. Um, so Kati Piri just um, already referred a bit to the long-term relationship and what to expect in areas that are maybe not part of the negotiations at the moment, like foreign and security and defense policy. And there are also other areas um, where the EU and the UK have shared interests. Um, so Fabian, I would like to ask you um, to maybe look a bit beyond the ongoing negotiations for us and um, give us your view on the long-term relationship. Um, do you expect a normalization of relations post-Brexit or will the um, relationship remain difficult and maybe be even more conflictual? Um, and do you think the current UK government um, will be interested in close cooperation in areas of mutual interest, such as foreign and um, security policy or climate change, global pandemics, or do you expect them to dist distance themselves um, from the EU as much as possible? Um, thanks, Janneke. Yes, I, I think it very much depends. Um, it depends on, uh, in my view, um, two interrelated issues. One is the question of what is driving the political thinking uh, in uh, the UK government. Um, and I think there, maybe also from a European perspective, um, we have underestimated a bit this issue of sovereignty. Um, that ultimately, um, because we don't see the sense in this argument, uh, we have um, somewhat dismissed it. And I think um, there is a, a real danger that um, at least somewhere around Boris Johnson, um, that there are people who see the achievement of their definition of sovereignty um, as the ultimate goal, and that they're willing to pay a very high price. Um, to achieve that. And I would argue that maybe that's what we have seen already in the rejection of, for example, even the consideration of foreign and security policy. Um, no one would expect that the UK will simply sign up to EU mechanisms um, post uh, Brexit, but that you are refusing to even negotiate on it, for me, is quite a strong signal. And there seems to be um, an almost uh, Trumpian emphasis at times on sovereignty, on the nation state as the proper um, unit for negotiation with a rejection of the whole idea uh, of the European Union. Um, I'm not saying that everyone in government thinks that way. Uh, there are clearly people um, which don't think that way, but I think there are some people in government where you see that kind of tendency coming through. Um, so if that is their um, driving force, um, then that will also make cooperation with the European Union on any topic more difficult in future. Um, I think the other big factor which will uh, influence this, and of course it's linked uh, to the sovereignty um, fixation, is the question of what kind of deal we will have. Um, a year ago, um, I wrote a piece on the long-term relationship um, where I summarized it as bad, worse, or catastrophic. Um, bad would be uh, a deal because while I fully agree with everyone that it's better to have a deal uh, than not to have a deal, 
Uh, I think we also have to recognize how far short that deal is going to fall uh, in relation to the ambitions we've had in relations uh, to even what was written in the political declaration. Uh, the deal is not going to be nothing like that, um, but it is still a lot better than no deal. Um, but if we have no deal, I think the risk is rather high that rather than uh, the UK returning to the negotiation table, seeing sense then negotiating something uh, post uh, end of transition, I think what we would get into with no deal is an acrimonious uh, situation where there would be a blame game on both sides, uh, where there potentially, um, well, almost certainly I would argue, uh, there will be a breach of the withdrawal agreement because it would be very hard uh, for Boris Johnson to argue that he's put these contingencies into uh, the internal markets bill into uh, the finance bill, and then not use them in case of no deal. Um, that would um, be illogical. And I think uh, it would also be attacked by his own party. So I think we will very, very quickly get into um, acrimony. We will get into conflict. And I'm here talking also about what will happen on some of the flashpoints. How do we deal with issues which arise, for example, when uh, European trawlers go into British waters. Um, so for me, the, the risk is very much that if we don't have a deal, that the relationship becomes catastrophic, that it's very, very difficult to find any way forward. And despite all of that, I still think that it is more likely that we don't get a deal, because in the end, um, it is not about what will happen. It is about what Boris Johnson thinks will happen and what he thinks he can get away with. Uh, and there, I'm far from certain uh, that he will come to the conclusion that he needs a deal politically. And on top of that, I think the risk, as I mentioned before, of ending up uh, with no deal by accident also remains very high. So uh, I'm afraid that um, in my view, we are heading for the worst possible outcome but I very much hope to be proven wrong on that. Thank you, Fabian. Um, Ivan, are you signaling that you would like to comment yes. on that? Yes. Yeah. Um, look, I think we have to take this in different chunks. The, on the foreign policy and security and defence sort of agendas, there's been no enthusiasm under this government for a deep and close relationship with the European Union and its institutions. And I don't think there will be under a Boris Johnson government. And that doesn't surprise me. I worked for him as foreign secretary and there wasn't much enthusiasm then about working around the Foreign Affairs Council table or dealing with the External Action Service or whatever. Um, I don't think that will change under a Johnson government. If we think about what is the purpose of Brexit? Um, yes, sovereignty, they do conceive of in a very different way from uh, most other players in the European Union. I agree with that. And there are different versions of sovereigntists within the UK. There's the old style Bill Cash type sovereigntists going back to the early 90s. And before in the Maastricht debates, there's new style sort of sovereigntists inside the Conservative Party. And Johnson is a sort of uneasy combination of, of that. But I mean, in terms of where we now are, given that we have left, we've chosen to exit what is a regulatory superpower, because I've always thought of Brussels as having an enormous regulatory reach and extraterritorial reach in its regulation, and that's precisely what Eurosceptics most dislike about it. Lots of people on this call will think it's wrong-headed to have done what they've done, but they have done it and they've won a referendum and we have now Brexited. If you've Brexited, the entire UK system has to think differently and is starting to think differently about what we do with our freedom and our autonomy. And that's where I sort of, I don't want to sound as gloomy as, uh, as Fabian, because it's always good to be on a call where somebody's more gloomy than me. It's also quite a rare experience. Um, but why is this going to be bumpy and spiky and difficult over the next few years? Because the UK is going to make a merit of divergence in multiple different areas, uh, driven partly by sort of ideological sovereignism, but partly by a belief that it can be more nimble more agile, less of a bear moth, 
uh, less of a lowest common denominator, very slow process of regulation and legislation through the Council and European Parliament. And therefore, it can steal a march, it can get a competitive advantage against the European Union by being more agile and more flexible and moving much faster for opportunities in the world than the European Union. Now, you hear that from very same people who did not start on the Brexit side of the debate and were not on that side of the debate in 2016. But if you think of what's going to happen in the UK system, the idea that there's going to be a large number of people inside UK departments at official or ministerial level arguing for ongoing deep convergence with the European Union, it's obvious fantasy world. I mean, that's not what's going to happen. So you're going to get more and more bumpy trade flare-ups where the UK, I mean, the UK will then frequently assert, well, what we're doing is basically trying to achieve the same outcomes as all, as you, all of you in the European Union, but we're doing so by, via radically different legislative means. And the EU will frequently respond, we don't buy a word of that, you're obviously trying to undercut, uh, you're trying to dump, you're trying to uh, deliver different outcomes, and there's going to be a whole series of debates, whether that's on data or on financial services or on environmental legislation, social legislation. You can see the conflicts coming in the next two to three years as the UK progressively, legislatively diverges, because we're just not going to keep the European Union a key forever on our rule book across multiple domains. And departments will make a merit of giving advice to their ministers to say, now we're autonomous, now we're sovereign, now we're free. We can do things differently because we want to scrap this bit of the rule book and train, change it quite radically. Now, the question for all of us, because you can't stop that process. I mean, what on earth was the point of Brexit unless it's to diverge from the rule book that you wanted to get out of? I mean, if you wanted just to replicate the European rule book, you wouldn't have stayed, you'd have stayed in the European Union. And Boris Johnson told me, you know, more than once as foreign secretary that the purpose of Brexit was divergence. Well, if the purpose of Brexit is divergence, then we're going to do quite a lot of diverging over the remaining years of this government. And then the question, which always bothered me, as Stefan and others will know from day one, in fact, from before the referendum, is how do you set up governance mechanisms to deal with divergence, to, to try and find ways to diffuse hand grenades uh, early on in the process? to manage processes both politically and bureaucratically and between regulators and supervisors so that these things are not exploding all the time, but recognizing with due wisdom on both sides that we are probably going to take different courses and frequently be competitors with different types of legislative and regulatory regimes, which are going to move further apart. And, and the EU is gonna to have to think quite hard about that as well, because you now do have a serious competitor on your uh, doorstep, obviously not remotely of the size of the European Union, but much bigger than Switzerland and Norway, that will behave much more aggressively than either Switzerland or Norway, because it'll think it can reap competitive advantage from doing so. So when you're thinking about your sort of differentiation, I think there's massive uh, project, you know, there are a lot, there are a great deal of, big things to be thinking about across multiple different economic and security domains about how do you keep the conversation going between the two sides of the channel and put enough beef and substance into it that both sides actually want to partake in that conversation whilst recognizing that we're probably increasingly going to diverge over the next five to ten years in some of the solutions to some of the problems. <laughs> Thank you Ivan for that. Um, I know Stefan wants to come in on that um, before you do, I would just like to throw in a couple of questions that we've received in the Q&A box that also relate to um, what happens to the relationship next year and um, maybe also what happens if there is a no deal. So we got a question from uh, John Doyle who asks, what uh, does the panel think the chances are for mini deals in, in a separate, less politically toxic areas? Um, so that would probably be um, post a no deal scenario. Um, and then um, Michael Cherney asks, would the expected pain and disturbance caused by the scenario, a no deal scenario, have any impact on the respective positions? So I guess the question, if there is a no deal and both sides come back to the negotiating table next year, would that change the EU's position in any way? Um, Stefan, maybe you could take these questions on while also responding to to what Ivan and Fabian have said before. Yes, but I also wanted to actually come back to Malcolm and James, which we seem to have forgotten on the 
uh, in terms of the questions that, that, that came. So and, and good afternoon to Malcolm as well. It's, it's also a rainy afternoon here in Brussels. I'm actually sitting behind a window, hoping that natural light would shine on me, but uh, that doesn't seem to happen. Um, your question was more on UK internal politics. And I, of course, we observe that and, and, and we carefully follow that, but it doesn't affect the way the EU positions itself and, and how the EU defines what's in its interest in these negotiations, that has always been the case uh, since day one of the, of the withdrawal negotiations. James' question was more about the role of the, the other institutions uh, in case there is a deal. So once and if there is a deal, there will of course be a legal text. And we already have the outline of a legal text on a, on a wide range of issues. And so the, the final text is certainly possible on, on the issues that, that I haven't yet mentioned yet in, in, in the introduction. So. The three stumbling blocks are the core issues that still need to be bridged. So, but once as negotiators, the, the commission comes up with a, with a legal text, of course, you will need to give sufficient time to parliament and to member states to scrutinize that text that, that goes without saying, and, and there will be little time, but I'm sure member states will be, will be well organized to do that. I mean, Ivan made reference to data, to uh, environmental legislation, there is the issue of fundamental rights here and law enforcement and judicial cooperation. There are a lot of politically sensitive issues in there and no doubt the European Parliament and all 27 member states will want to, will want to have a detailed analysis on their side as well of the text. So it's a bit hard to answer James' question today because we don't know if there will be a negotiated outcome and we don't know when. Um, but that process will also have to take place. I mean, the, concluding with the UK government and, and between the European Commission and the UK government is not the end of the, of the road on the EU side, of course. There is still a process to go to now. Michel Barnier has spoken to Coreper yesterday. The Commission spoke to Coreper last Friday. He speaks to the, Michel Barnier speaks to the European Parliament, of course, very regularly. So there are no surprises in what will come up, but still we are now in the final days and, 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 and things are, things need to shape up. So. A bit hard to, to answer James' question precisely. Um, on then all the other issues, honestly, I cannot, I cannot entertain that, uh, th th those questions today. If there is a no deal, well, we have the readiness notices that we have published, there are over 90, and they are quite clear on what happens on the 1st of January. Whether the commission will then propose additional contingency measures, I'm, that's something that is being considered. Um, Cathy spoke about the time the parliament will need and then the, the pressure from member states, but we are, I'm still not in, in a position today to say what, if any contingency measures the, the commission will, will want to propose. So I can't really, enter, but clearly um, questions on mini deals, the things we have heard for the last three years, I, I, I wouldn't put my, my money on that. Thank you, Stefan. Um, so, um, Time is short, um, but we still have a few um, virtual hands up. And I would like to at least um, let in one or two more voices from our audience before we wrap up. And I know that Stefan also has to leave five minutes early. So I would like to ask um, our audience members to be brief in their questions. Um, so let's see if we can get um, Adam Isaacs. Um, would you please post your question? Yes, um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for the discussion. Um, a confession, for my sins, I'm the chair of the Conservative Association in Belgium and have been for the last eight years, um, although relations are up and down. And I'm less optimistic than Malcolm and less optimistic than Fabian or Sir Ivan um, for an agreement because attacking Brussels is the one thing that will hold Johnson's coalition together uh, going forward. He's worried about the lockdown uh, rebellion. But the other piece of news which probably passed you by was that yesterday the Conservative Party appointed a new international ambassador and they appointed Daniel Hannan. So if there's a sign of the policy that the Conservative Party wants to pursue going forward, it's very much anti-Brussels, pro-nostalgic colonialism, white empire commonwealth days and i really have less grounds for optimism than i did even a week ago thank you um 
I would like to um, have another voice from the audience. We have a question from Joost van Jessel. Um, would you like to come in? Joost, you would need to unmute yourself. Please. Uh, Mr. Rogers, thank you very much for your very comprehensive uh, expectation of what will happen in the first quarter of, uh, of next year, whether there will be a deal or no deal. It is a turmoil anyway. And maybe the turmoil of no deal uh, is better explainable and uh, for the blame on, on the European Union than, um, than uh, the other side and uh, than the deal. Okay. In this perspective, a question on the long term. It is a long, I have a long standing view that it makes a lot, uh, a huge of a difference whether you are in a club or outside a club. When you are in a club, you can quarrel, you can have differences of views, you can have different priorities, okay. But in the end, you know that you have to come to, to a consensus. If you are out to deal, out of, uh, out of the club, um, psychologically, the whole atmosphere is different. Then you reason, you are reasoning from a point of view of, uh, uh, how can I uh, get the best uh, the best position in any in any thing? And you you start looking only at your own premises instead of taking the other side already into account. In that perspective, I feel that it is a very difficult to make any assessment at this very moment uh, of what's going to happen in the long term. And secondly, that we are in a way with empty hands because the other side has um, is, 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 is in a different train on, on, the, on a different rail. Uh, and how can you bring these two irreconcilable things together? Thank you um, for this comment and question. Um, so I would like to wrap up this um, session now. Um, we have had different degrees of optimism and pessimism from our panel as well as from our audience. Uh, so I would like to give each of you the chance to first of all react to these last comments and questions, but maybe also give us a sense of um, how your sense of optimism is at this point in time and do you, what, you, what your view is are the chances for a deal um, at this point. Um, and I'd like to give the floor to Stefan first, because I know that um, he has to leave at 25 past. Well, I think to bounce back on Ivan's point, it, it depends on the purpose of sovereignty as the UK sees it. Um, what is it for? I mean, there is sovereignty as, as a country, but there's also sovereignty as the capacity to achieve things. And so that is for me the, the crucial question for the days to come. Uh, that there will be divergence on the UK side as, as an essential and defining element of Brexit for the years to come, I think that's clear. But the key question for me is, can the sovereignty be used to frame that divergence, to frame that competition in a way which makes it open and fair? And that remains, it's, it's the first, it's the core question since day one and it remains the question uh, uh, today and tomorrow and perhaps over the next days. Thank you, Stefan. Um, so um, maybe Ivan Rogers, um, you could go next very briefly, um, oh. comment to the questions and um, how optimistic are you at this point? Well, on Mr. Isaac's uh, qu question or comment, uh, yes, I saw Dan Hannan's uh, appointment. I also saw Douglas Carswell had been appointed to the Board of Trade. I, I, I confess I hadn't been aware that Douglas Carswell was a trade expert, but there you are. Um, now, you can read that either way, is all I would say to Mr. Isaacs. Uh, uh, as I say, uh, Prime Minister Johnson has benefited from uh, the elimination of his two Conservative predecessors uh, and, and been a personal beneficiary of both and brought about the demise of both David Cameron and Theresa May. He wishes to avoid the same fate himself. Revolutions do have a ab habit of eating their own children, as I've said more than uh, once in the last three or four years. 
Uh, he must be aware now that his own version of the revolution might be slightly less pure than other people's version of the revolution. And the question is, are they coming to eat him next? And so he may be taking um, uh, the Hannans and Carswells and various others on the uh, more on the ultra right and uh, irreconcilable uh, Eurosceptic right into the tent in order to avoid them giving him trouble if he tries to sell a deal in the next week or two. Who knows? You can read this either way, as I say. Do I think that the Conservative Party under Johnson or any time soon is going to come back to a more uh, pro-European perspective with a desire for a deeper and closer relationship with the European Union? No, I do not. And I don't think any of you should uh, expect it. That comes to the point about the psychologically being outside a club. We haven't got used to being psychologically outside a club and that's bedeviled UK negotiators, I'm afraid, in my view, for the last four years, both under Theresa May and Boris Johnson. I never particularly like the language of cherry picking, but I do understand what European counterparts uh, mean when they say it. And the difficulty is the UK has wanted to maximize market access and keep market access arrangements in multiple different sectors as close as possible to what we used to get within the single market and the customs union. But we're not prepared to meet the obligations uh, of membership of those clubs. I do think that will change gradually over time after the end of the transition period, because this country will have to get used to the idea of being um, a third country as far as the European Union is concerned and operating, therefore, very differently. I agree with you. Psychologically, that's very different. As I say, it's a conscious, deliberate, sovereignist decision to take yourselves out of a regulatory superpower that you don't like because of the juridical and political implications of the sharing of sovereignty. That's very close to, you know, Johnson, Cummings, Gove, Sunak, all the rest of them are avid, serious Brexiteers and, uh, and always have been. Um, if that's your view, then you're going to plough a different farrow and you're going to make a merit of it. And you're going to tell the public that what we are going to be able to do as a result of our independence and autonomy is radically different and better than if we'd had to share our legislation and regulation process with 27 others and reach co lowest common denominator outcomes. So I think the EU side of the table also needs to get used to the idea that the UK is going to head in that direction. I suppose my one plea to the European side of the table uh, on this call, because there are many more non-Brits than Brits on this call, is from a European Union perspective, looking at the last four and a half years, it's also been fairly miserable. There will be many on the European side who will think that tactically they've won virtually every battle against successive British prime ministers. That may or may not be right. The question is where over the medium and longer term does the European Union see the relationship with Britain? Britain is not going to be categorizable in the way that Norway or Switzerland or Ukraine are. We're obviously a very different type of player, potentially kind of more belligerent and more difficult um, and deliberately so. We're going to be a competitor, so there are going to be elements of conflict and one has to find ways of managing those conflicts so that they don't flare up the entire time and bedevil the relationship to the exclusion of everything we would actually want to do together. And that requires a lot of very intelligent thinking about machinery. It also, I'm afraid, still involves thinking about European construction, and that's your differentiation project. Um, we never found a way to keep the UK happy inside a European Union where the bulk of the projects it wants to undertake, deeper integration, are not ones we wanted to be in. We didn't want to be in the Euro, we don't want to be in fiscal union, we don't want to be in banking union, we don't want to be in Schengen. At one stage, we avidly wanted both the enlargement of the European Union and to be in the single market, the customs union. We've now decided we're not interested in enlargement and we don't want to be in the single market and customs union either. And I do think the European side has to reflect on that, not because, you know, they must spend all their time reflecting on the British. I would have thought that most people are bored rigid with the British after the last four and a half years. But if you ever want to get to a different style of conversation with a different British government in the next decade or two, people are going to have to think again about how does this thing work and how does this thing work for people who never want to go as deep in integration as the core members of the Eurozone and core members of Schengen. And that's still an unanswered question, in my view, on the process of European integration. Thank you, Ivan. Um, so, Fabian, if you would, some final remarks. Um, you can pick up anything that has been mentioned by our audience. 
Um, but maybe also in one or two minutes, um, what do you think are the chances for a deal at this point? Um, thanks, Janneke, and, and thanks also to the other panelists. Yes, um, I uh, remain pessimistic. Um, as many of you know, I have been um, pessimistic about achieving a deal for quite some time. Um, I think that probably has deepened because I think not only uh, is there this political judgment which Johnson um, will make, uh, but there is also this risk of no deal by accident in particular caused by the ongoing brinkmanship um, as we have argued in our publication. Um, I think what we also need to look at is the EU side to this. Um, sometimes I feel that uh, we are so focused on um, the shenanigans in the UK that we forget a bit about um, that this is also a big political ask on this side. And I would highlight two things um, which I think are still rather dangerous. One uh, is the question of whether there has been enough preparation of domestic audiences on the EU side for a potential compromise on some of these areas. Um, as far as I can see, for example, we have not had the discussions with um, the fishing industry about uh, what kind of um, reductions they will have to face um, in uh, event of a deal. So this um, domestic politics in the EU still, I think, is, is rather dangerous. Um, and because the deal, if there is one, will only have a very short time to be scrutinized. There's a lot of risk that things can go wrong, even if we do conclude um, some form of deal. I think the other point, and I, I think we don't emphasize it enough, and certainly in the UK, it's, it is not emphasized enough, is the UK internal market bill or the finance bill, the tax bill, which is coming now, uh, with this um, uh, reckless um, approach to breaking international law and torpedoing uh, the outcome of any negotiation. And there has to come a point at which the European Union also says enough is enough. We cannot negotiate with someone who attempts to blackmail us um, to give them a deal which they like with the threat of breaking an agreement they've only signed a few months beforehand. I think here the European Union also has to be very careful about what that does to our reputation in the rest of the world, what that does to um, our position in other negotiations, if it looks like another country can use the threat of breaking the agreements with us as a tool. And we should also consider that some of the arguments by which Johnson might push through a deal if there is one, could well be that he says to his MPs, well, we'll break it if we don't like it anyway. Um, whether that's feasible or not, I think the European Union has to be very careful uh, about not accepting that kind of rhetoric um, from supposedly a partner with whom you are signing an agreement. Um, my final point and very briefly is on the long-term relationship. I think whatever happens and however acrimonious things get, there will be an EU-UK relationship. Uh, the question is just what form it will take, um, how cooperative it is, how uh, we manage to also achieve common, um, common goals. Um, we shouldn't forget that, for example, COP26 next year, we have to have an alliance between the Western powers to try to get to an agreement uh, which pushes us to a great ambition um, on climate change mitigation. And this is something where we will need to work together. And now we have the chance of having a White House, which uh, is more in favor of this. Um, so we need to find ways or on those kind of topics, how we continue to work together. And that's also why the EPC is running the track two uh, negotiations, because we think it is very important that we can continue the um, conversation on how we can um, determine a future relationship regardless of the ongoing negotiations. Thank you, Fabian, um, for that assessment. Um, we've come to uh, an end of our discussion. Uh, I think it is clear that um, at this point there is still a high risk for a no deal by accident. 
And um, no matter the outcome of the negotiations, the EU-UK relationship um, will become much more conflictual and difficult in the years to come. Um, we know that the UK will want to diverge um, and um, it is uncertain in what areas they will actually be willing to um, be seen to closely cooperate with the EU, um, even when it comes to, to areas of a global shared agenda where it would be very important, for example, in the area of uh, climate change, as Fabian has mentioned. Um, I would like to thank our excellent panelists for their expertise and time. Um, also to Stefan and Kati Piri, who um, have already left us, but um, I think it was very valuable to hear from them. And of course, um, from Sir Ivan Rogers, um, very interesting to hear your thoughts um, on uh, the situation in the UK. And thanks to Fabian. Um, thank you also to our audience for your interest and for your questions. Apologies if we didn't answer your question. There were too many to come to all of them. Um, I hope you enjoyed also learning more about the EU IDEA project. And please feel free to follow the project on social media. Um, you will receive a short survey after the end of this um, panel, and it would be great if you could take two minutes to give us some feedback on the discussion. Um, so thanks to everyone and have a nice afternoon and see you soon.